Hi, everybody. Welcome to Queer Aging, Dying, Death, and Loss. I'm Robert Berenger, uh, he, him pronouns, and then we have, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, hit that little button. I have to, oh, you hear me now? Yeah, thanks. My name is Max Kleiberg, he, him pronouns also, and I'm from uh, Sweden, uh, Stockholm. So just to get started for a roundtable setup, um, we wanted to be pretty interactive, so we'd love for you to move forward so you could actually just ask us questions without going back and forth to the microphone. So if anyone wants to move up, um, that would be great. Um, we're going to be doing an uh, agenda focusing on the investigate, investigating ways in which 2S LGBTQ plus people can be supported and empowered to live authentically in old age at the end of life and in bereavement. Um, the discussion, we're going to put a few notes on the flip chart, so hopefully you give us some good ideas in terms of research and where we want to move going forward, and we'll probably take a, a, a little uh, photo of our flip chops later. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so if, for when you're asking questions or uh, providing us with some examples, we ask that you share brief versions of your stories. Um, we like to guide the conversation through some prepared questions we have, and um, Please help us encourage everyone's participation. So uh, do feel free to move closer if you like. So to start off, and here we are asking you questions already. What does the term end of life mean to you? How about you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about me? Okay. Um, so end of life to me means that I hope that I'll become really old <laughs> uh, and will die peacefully. Nate, do you need to say, want to say something? Okay, oh, that's nice. Um, yes. Is this all? Oh, good. Yeah, so if anybody's a question, Nate would bring the uh, microphone to you. Or not a questioner. What does end of life mean to you? Yes. Uh, after 65, maybe? Sorry. <laughs> or, yeah, maybe 85, something like that. I don't, I love numbers, so. I think for me, it means life. Oh, life, end of life means life. That's what it means for me. I think for me it means like the point in your life, what, like no matter what it's happening, whether it's age or like disease, is that you are now, instead of planning for life, you're planning for the end of your life. Mm -hmm. You're starting to plan those things and focus on what's gonna happen when you're not here and how you would like that to happen. Um, I, I bring a nursing perspective, and in our profession, at least here in what's known as Canada, it often includes thinking about, as you mentioned, um, like planning for or preparing for a time when your future goals are to have a good death. So n often related to disease or other processes, um, but not always. Like uh, one of the things we think about is like your goals of care here. So are you a person who wants to be resuscitated uh, if you should stop breathing? Are you a person who only wants medical treatment or are you a person who just wants comfort care at the end of your life? Um, for me, anyways, uh, term end of life to me means end of life planning, which is constantly um, ongoing. So everyone in my family, um, all eight of us, have already planned what we want for our deaths. I think one of the aspects of the term end of life to me means that when you need assistance in maintaining basic functions of your life, like eating, drinking, etc., when you need assistance to do the basic things that the average person 
could do regularly on their own. Um, yeah, that's one of the aspects of the term end of life for me. Um, in relating to those aspects of planning uh, and things like that, to me, when I think of end of life, it also means uh, maintenance of agency, being able to have uh, wishes respected to still be uh, treated as a person with full control, um, all of that. And then if you know that your capacity to make decisions on your own might be uh, leaving, having the chance to make sure that you can designate trusted uh, individuals who can help carry uh, your comfort and your wishes even though you may no longer have the direct agency to influence those. I think there was maybe just one more there at the back. Can I ask one more, Tim? So I'm, 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 my apologies on coming a little bit late, but from my understanding, the aspect of the end of term life for me and, and my culture is that there is no actual end of, end of life. It's a, it's a cyclical sort of, it's very seasonal. And when we're looking at going on that journey home, there is a lot of protocol that comes with that. So even as, uh, thank you so much to my friend over here who talked about like planning, even that with, is, is within that ceremony of honoring that, that individual. So I, I, I walk with those teachings that they're never actually gone. Yeah. They're just in a different form. Yeah, that's, that's interesting perspective to think of, you know, different cultural differences as well as, you know, someone mentioned 65 and up, and then we also heard about maybe you have some kind of chronic illness and stuff. Um, so it's really dynamic. For example, say you're, you know, 47 and they say you have type two diabetes now and it's like, oh, Maybe I'm not going to survive as long as I thought. And so there's a lot of dynamics there. Uh, we asked this question uh, just because the, the ex sort of definitions have expanded. And um, it, it used to be more to, um, I wrote some, other, wrote some other terms down here. Yeah, I, I wrote some other terms, like now they have from this, uh, I think it's the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, um, end of life, that part of life where a person is living with and impaired by an, event an eventually fatal condition, even if the prognosis is ambiguous or unknown. So we have a much longer time frame going into um, end of life. And then they also have definitions for like terminal, condi uh, terminal conditions as well as actively dying. And one of, the, one of the points I wanted to make about end of life is that um, we tried to use this expanded definition back in uh, 2015, 2016, doing some research. And so we just said, um, are you a member of the 2SLGBTQ plus community? Are you 65 or over? And we just said, do you have one or more chronic conditions? So it was a pretty easy criteria to fit into our study and, and learn about end of life. But when we were attempting to recruit, I'd get these emails back and um, like, like I, I especially would email some people that I knew, and I, I emailed someone, for example, I know he had like three chronic conditions, he was like 74 years old, and, and he was an older gay man, and he's like, well, that's not me, I'm not near end of life, and it's like, well, you do fit our criteria, but, so he wouldn't participate in our, our study. So that's where I think it's interesting how we're evolving the term end of life, and um, when I did my research with hospice and palliative care, um, we did a really expanded version because we wanted to talk uh, not just to people in hospice, but receiving uh, palliative care, maybe they lived in long-term care or even assisted living, and then also um, people who received home care. And um, I should go to the next slide. Yeah. Let's see here. So, so actually, I guess I should have advanced to this slide first. Since I just talked about expanding definitions in both research and practice. Did you want to say anything before I go on to this section? Uh, no, I think it's... Okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk about um, the research project I did with um, Island Health and um, in, in the Island Health region looking at um, 2S LGBTQ plus engagement with hospice and palliative care. 
so sort of the rationale for the study we have, um, you know, that 2S um, LGBTQ plus elders, they face, um, they have many health disparities compared to the, uh, you know, cisgender heterosexual population. Um, discrimination over the life course and think way back to, you know, the early time in the um, AIDS epidemic and, and you think of the stigma related to that when they used to call it grid, gay related infectious disease, a real kind of like blame the victim focus there. Um, heteronormative assumptions, um, when you avoid uh, topics such as talking about sexual orientation and I'll have some more examples of some overt homophobia in, in the um, description here of the research. trying to speed it up so we have more time for questions. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to learn people's experiences and, and, and see whether or not they were, what, what their level of satisfaction is. One of the things in the next few slides when I talk about themes is that um, the, the, the slides are on themes, but in the project itself, I actually, um, the, the research from the patients and the caregivers went from, oh, we were very satisfied to they killed my partner, which however was a quite a bit of an outlier. So that doesn't really show up in, in the slides I had as much, but I wanted to just mention that we had such a distance in, in terms of people's experiences. So um, I'm just gonna go over sort of quickly the, the basic themes here. Um, we had a theme on inclusivity and it included commentary around symbols and language, belonging and authenticity. And if you see here in the slide, um, well, uh, first I'll just tell you that we had, um, it was during the pandemic, so we had a little bit smaller recruitment. Uh, I ended up talking with um, uh, three or four patients, about seven caregivers, and 10 or 11 hospice pal palliative care staff. So in symbols language, they talked about um, making feel people comfortable, and that was all about, you know, wearing pins and hanging out flags. But um, as you see in the third theme here, authenticity, the, the members of the community that we talked to and our caregivers really felt that it has to be authentic. Like, you can't just go and hang out that, uh, you know, LGBTQ flag or that rainbow flag and, you know, say, okay, we're all set for you. Because if you kind of don't have that training behind it, there's, there actually is a potential for harm, I believe. So competency, um, the, 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 about competent staff, um, people did think there was a it was necessary to have some specialized training. And you see here that um, one of the uh, caregivers I spoke with, he said, many fine people doing very dif difficult job on, or under very difficult circumstances. And then you see another on the care side, he says, on the care side, which I couldn't say anything bad about them, the latter comment uh, provides a hint that beyond the care, there was a lot of um, frustration with the bureaucracy and administration. So in, in, in these settings, people were quite, they had some good experiences with care. Um, so we had positive experiences. They were categorized into individual and, and systems level praise. Um, one that one said under systems level, we were happy with ER, my partner really gets respectful, good care. Um, and, and so it was really positive. Actually, I had that experience myself with, with my partner in, in, in hospital settings on Vancouver Island, so it was actually quite nice. Um, so now a little bit of a, you know, more of the things we might sort of unfortunately expect. Uh, the theme of distrust included commentary around systems level and individual distrust. So I, um, says one person says, I treat the administrators as different entity that we are dealing with. They're more on the business side, which I really don't care about and very leery about home support. Uh, the talk about home support was pretty consistent that um, that seemed to be where most of the issues came up. Um, as an example, and in talking about the idea of training, is I had um, a lesbian couple, they were telling her, well, her partner had passed away by the time I, I spoke with her but they had a home care worker come into their home and then they, uh, to help them with the bath. You know, the, they disrobed the, the woman who needed the care, 
put her in the bath, and then so there she is in kind of the most vulnerable position. And the partner's there as well, and the, the, the home care worker says, oh, are you two sisters, right? So that, that heteronormative assumption at the worst possible time for them, and, and, and the caregiver really emphasized that it was the worst possible time, and you know, just that, that it, it does inflict that, now what do I do, and that they had to, she had to have that instant judgment of like, oh, do I tell her it's my partner, do I not? And so that constant, you know, negotiating your identity, right? So stigma, we're gonna talk about minority stress if we have time at the end. Um, just, we'll, yeah, hopefully we'll get time to talk about the uh, adaptation to gay populations. But I just wanted to highlight a couple things that were, were said to me in the research. And uh, so one, an, an act of stigma refers to an explicit behavior such a, as a homophobic slur. And here we have, uh, th this is actually from the, the person who eventually said that, you know, the system killed my partner, but she said the, the manager would, would be talking about to people saying, they're lezzies, they're two lezzies. And this is only a handful of years ago that, that this experience happened. And, you know, she overheard that of people talking in the hallway near the room of her partner. Um, expectation of rejection. Um, a caregiver noted, he said, working for gays means they don't have to do a good job or they can get sloppy or they don't have to show up when they say they're going to show, show up. So he felt that just by being a gay couple that people would sort of treat you differently. And in um, concealment, um, healthcare service providers observe many 2S LGBTQ plus patients that they may still identify as roommates. Uh, this, this was a theme that was in some research I presented last week, um, talking about physician experiences with advanced care planning. And many of them said, I said, oh, did they disclose to you that they were a gay couple? And they said, the physician says, no, I just knew because I could tell the way they talked about home and this and that and, and, and their life stories. But so even with the trust of having those conversations about death and dying, they still felt like saying, well, this is my friend or my roommate. And in terms of losses, um, we were talking, somebody talked about this earlier on the comments about end of life. Um, loss of an advocating voice was described by um, caregivers, patients, and the um, hospice palliative care service providers. Um, a caregiver noted that they were not recognized as a decision maker. Um, one patient felt that being gay and lesbian as was so isolating, felt like it didn't matter, got very depressed. And um, the, um, the hospice and care care service providers even noticed that there was that difference in um, what family wanted versus what the client wanted and maybe what the partner wanted. So there was that kind of uh, dynamic of tension. So our next question is, has any, um, anyone had any experience with a partner or loved one in hospice care, long-term care, or using home, -term, home care? So maybe if Nate wants to. Pass it around. Okay, thanks. Did you have a guess? I actually say this quite openly in regards to my own experiences. Sorry, I have a very deep voice. It's the testosterone. Um, <laughs> But that being said, it was my Nikum Palm, uh, my late grandmother, the, the person who raised me, that we had walked with her on her, her life journey as she was going home. And this was in the hospital. As, uh, as, as things were progressing, it was apparent that unfortunately this is the time. So as, as time went, the moccasin trail worked the way it did and it brought everyone that needed to, to be there, there. But as we were going through this, there's also aspects of, of ceremony, like these little life ceremonies that we need to do. And that's being able to smudge while we're in these spaces, being able to tell the uh, hospital staff that are walking around, we're gonna smudge now. And we can say that at any point. But that being said, just that little barrier of we need to smudge now creates the permission to just be 
as indigenous people mm -hmm. and practice our protocols in that particular journey. So I do want to say uh, that little point there, but how loving environment was then created around her to go through that ceremony and speak with her at a, at a point where uh, during that, that, that particular life ceremony, people unfortunately revert back to a space where they were feeling comfort and home. And for her, it, it was only Cree that she could speak and none of us could speak Cree. So I, I think I pondered that as well when we're looking at hospice and we're looking at that life journey uh, for folks. In what ways are we able to, to speak with those as they move into this other space. Um, but that being said, we luckily had my other Nakampam, who, uh, Delia, who unfortunately passed away just uh, last month. Um, she was there with us, and she's a fluent Cree speaker. So as we were going through this, she was able to whisper to her and say that loving, lovingness to her as she moved on. But it was nice to be able to have the environment there, the this, this ceremony. But that being said, within those spaces, there has to be con consideration of those overlaps and those intersectionalities where we can exist without permission, without asking yeah. permission. Mm. So, yeah. Can I ask one Great. Thanks. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Just add. I'm like, that's a closed-ended question. <laughs> yeah, to just sort of add to the discussion, you know, we had some, a, a few comments from the, the caregivers and, and patients that I had. So if you have a story from as a caregiver perspective or, you know, having a loved one in, in long-term care or using home care. Uh, okay, my name is Zach, for people that don't know me. Um, I think what I would say is Yes, I have this experience. I lost my partner three years ago. And um, it um, was a very isolating experience. And this is actually the first time I've been in a space to be able to talk with other people from my communities, I would say broadly, about yeah. this. So I think um, for me, even though in many ways we were very fortunate with the service, it always felt like if you happen to get you know, the overnight worker that didn't want to talk to you or that did or you just never really knew um, what was going to happen. Um, and I think even all the sort of end of life planning aspects, um, they just were not, you know, oriented to two SLGBTQ communities. Oh, I just want to ask, was the setting that you're talking about, was it a hospital setting or was it actually in hospice? It was... Um, Partly home care oh, okay. for as long as possible, but then we had to go to a palliative care unit okay. at a long-term care space. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I will. I won't get into all the details, obviously, but I just think having the chance to talk about it yeah. um, is so key. And you know, our communities are continue to be so impacted by um, HIV. Uh, but there were really no other services. And, you know, after my partner passed away, I was trying to look for, are there any, like, queer, positive mm -hmm. supports? And the only people that had any supports were HIV services, yeah. right? So it just feels like a really big gap and hard to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if we think about other reasons we're losing people in our communities, um, this feels very important. And I thank you yeah. for having this session. Well, thanks for sharing your story. Sorry to hear about your loss. Um, I did want to add to that. Um, one of the things I found just there, there's simple points is in, in uh, with hospice care. Um, I, I asked about how do you communicate information and or how did you know that patient was a gay man or a lesbian? And they said, oh, well, the person before me wrote it on a chart. So it doesn't have to go through that over and over of like, oh, I just learned that. So they actually passed along the information, it was great. But in other settings, that didn't get passed along. So that was obviously, you know, a lot more problematic. And I'm, does someone else have a... Perfect. Uh, sorry, one second. I just want to point out that I'm now using this as a <laughs> handheld microphone, but also that I'm making some notes. But obviously, I cannot uh, summarize your experiences. But what I'm writing down are sort of things that I'm picking up of, uh, are challenges or maybe needs. 
and I don't know if you can read it, probably not, because my handwriting is also terrible, but uh, like you talked about isolation and a need for queer support also in bereavement. Uh, and I thought you talked really beautifully about um, uh, creating space to exist authentically without needing permission. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Um, my, uh, my name is Beth. I'm a, a lesbian, non gender non conforming, she, they person. Um, and I'm as old as dirt looking around the room. <laughs> um, uh, so, my mother passed away about uh, seven years ago from a disease called progressive supranuclear palsy, which is quite rare um, and really awful. So it's kind of like ALS kind of symptomology. Um, and I think the context for me was that was particularly challenging as a queer person was the intersections between gender and sexual orientation and caregiving. So as a daughter, um, I have been expected to not only provide that care to my mother when she was ill, but also to my father now. And, um, and I came out at a time where uh, it was not unusual for uh, parents to have pretty strong reactions to the whole thing. So had um, sort of a fleeting exposure to conversion therapy. Um, None, m much of which was never really resolved in my relationship with my parents. So, um, so it, it creates a very complicated um, context um, in which to provide loving care for a parent who you love despite um, them having provided or injured you in, in some pretty deep ways. Um, to be a, bring a partner into that yeah. uh, and have the same expectations that the partner would be supportive. And in fact, my partner does work in um, uh, death, dying, and bereavement. Um, in fact, I think she knows you. Um, <laughs> um, we can talk after. Uh, so she was actually highly skilled and my family ended up depending on her to help us navigate systems, so hospital, um, long-term care, home care. She was a system navigator for us. None of which, it, there was ever any acknowledgement of the, of the, you know, remaining open wounds in the, yeah. in the familial relationships that we had. So I think it's, I think it, I'm speaking as a, as a um, woman identified person, but I think that um, gay men are probably Similarly expected, particularly if they don't have kids, um, to be the, the person who step up um, in those kinds of situations. And so I think that's a unique feature that we need to attend to. Thanks. Thanks. I guess, yeah, well, if you want to have a, just a last word here, and then I, I want to make sure that I sort of pass it along at the halfway point to Max for a little you bit. You bet. I'll be super brief. I just had an experience with a very dear friend of mine uh, who was... 28 years old when she was given a stage four breast cancer diagnosis. And one of the things that she described as she went through her palliative journey was feeling like she had to jump in and out of the closet depending on who was there, both because of the complex relationships with her Christian family and the complex um, experiences she had with home care workers, healthcare assistants, and people who needed to provide support to her during that process. Um, especially around her sexual needs. Um, you know, people would interrupt her and her partner having intimate time because it was, they came to check on something yeah. or to empty a drain or to do whatever. And she said, you know, depending on who it was and how they perceived what was going on impacted their care for the next eight hours or the next 24 hours, depending how long that person's rotation was or whatever. And so those, those tensions exist for young people who are dying and for older people who are dying, I think, that sexual element as well. Oh, I just, just wanted to ask, was that in a, um, a hospital setting? or It was a cross setting. Was, so home moved. care would say, we're coming oh, okay. between noon and 8 p.m. OK, thanks. Yeah. And so you know, she couldn't yeah. do what she wanted to do during those hours because she didn't know what to expect. Sure. 
Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for the comments. I did want to say, I was going to say something earlier, one thing. Um, in, in terms of collecting information, a lot of people say, oh, we need to have a way that we let people know. And um, one caregiver was talking about her brother and who unfortunately passed away um, just before she enrolled in, in the study. But um, he's an older gay man and she was helping him navigate through the system. And at one point uh, she spoke to a um, social worker and you know, this person had their, their piece of paper and, you know, oh, is your brother a member of a gay man or bisexual or whatever, you know, member of the community? And she said, yes. And, you know, and then she said, nothing was ever done with the information. And it was very frustrating for her that there were no services. Like, was it, someone mentioned that it's more the services for gay men or with HIV, but everywhere else it seems to be you know, people ask the information and not much gets done with that. Um, I'm just gonna advance here, because I think these have, the, so that Max can uh, get started on his uh, couple slides and talking about uh, participatory action research. Do you wanna come up here? I wonder if we have some time still left, if people want to share some more stories. Otherwise I continue. We don't wanna rush this either, so. So it's just about halfway, and then we probably should have time at the end, too. Yeah. Yeah. So hi again, everyone. Um, so I should probably give a little bit more background about uh, who I am and what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, because I'm from Sweden, I'm just visiting. Um, and I uh, am a postdoctoral researcher at the Medical University in Stockholm. Uh, I have a background in design and I'm queer myself. And right after my PhD, which was all around palliative care and public health, um, I applied for postdoc funding uh, to do uh, research on uh, LGBTQI plus uh, experiences of end of life care and how to improve that. Uh, and I got that funding and I embarked on that research project, which is great that I have my own funding, it's really luxurious, but I feel quite alone doing the work that I'm doing. Um, and long story short, I got in contact with, uh, with Robert through, through Nate and um, yeah, they said just come over and, <laughs> and, and here I am, um, trying to d just learn as much as I can at this conference. And, um, I also just have to say that it feels kind of overwhelming to be in a space like this because I've never been in a space like this where it's just a conference about queer health by queer people and it just feels really, really amazing. Um, and I hope you don't take it for granted because it doesn't exist everywhere. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the barriers and facilitators that I've encountered in uh, starting a participatory action research project around these issues. And I hope that you can help me. <laughs> uh, that's the idea. I have some questions for you at the end. So, um, so these issues are obviously related to a lot of different uh, people. And within the community, there's a ton of diversity. And there's also healthcare providers that are um, dealing with these issues, or should be. So I think the participatory action research for me is a way to um, organize all these different stakeholders around this issue to then together create change and knowledge uh, that will serve the community. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, how I started by connecting with healthcare services and the reactions that I got from that. So I just sort of naively maybe contacted people within my sort of extended network within healthcare services of so primary care, palliative care, cancer care, um, trying to find people to partner with in this project. And I got some really interesting responses. For example, people would say, oh, but we already treat everyone equally. So this is like not an issue. Uh, and I was surprised by that because it's, and also in Swedish, uh, um, the word for e uh, equality and equity is the same word. So it's kind of difficult to get to the root of that uh, problem and sort of explain that. But these are anyway healthcare professionals, right? So then I would expect them to understand this issue, but that's really not the case. Um, or people asking me, is this really a problem? We never meet older queer people. 
and then I have to explain, but you do, but maybe they just don't want to be out for you, or you don't because you're just not a good service. Uh, they want to avoid you, really. <laughs> um, or people would say, uh, yeah, we've come so far with equal rights in Sweden. Uh, and this is also something that I've heard a lot of you telling me, that, you've had, that you have this idea of Scandinavia and Sweden that's so progressive, which it is. But this is also kind of a toxic thing because then people don't think that they're, they're done, basically, which is really not the case. So this is not an issue. So why are you pointing out this group as having special needs, as if I'm the one discriminating? Um, and so I realized, okay, I'm, I'm hitting a wall here, and it's kind of tough for me personally too, and I'll get back to that later. So then I thought, okay, I need to probably just talk to my own people, you know, in my own community and see where I go there. So I um, work together with the national and some regional organizations, um, yeah, fighting for equal rights for LGBTQI people in Sweden. Um, and they often talk about uh, reaching out the, to the community. Uh, and also in Sweden, we don't have a word for community or like it doesn't translate. Uh, and, I, and you also talk a lot about community and I always think, what, what do you mean or what does it mean? Uh, it can mean so many different things. So what often happens now is that we use the English word community and then especially if you re talk to older people, it's like, what are you talking about? Um, and then also, who are we missing if we talk about community the whole time? Um, so for example, people who are involuntary lonely, who are, don't see themselves as uh, part of a community, people living in rural areas, uh, trans and non-binary people, women, these uh, two indigenous people. In Sweden, we also have an indigenous population, the Sami people. Um, and so, so yeah, so in, in working with these organizations, you sort of inherit and the, the challenges of these organizations that you partner with. Um, so that is one thing. And also what I've noticed is a sense of research tiredness. And I've heard some people at this conference talking about this too, like you're asking the same people the same questions all the time. So if I've been at a few meetings with uh, older queer folks who tell me, but you already know that our situation is bad. What are we gonna do about it now? And um, then I try to explain this idea about action research, that we really try and create a change that is meaningful. So I don't come to the community with a, with a set question that I want to explore and just sort of extract and publish and whatever. But we really try and create a change and this takes time. So um, I'm in a process of, yeah, getting familiar with, with the community and, um, so what we're doing now, it's actually gonna happen the week after I, I come back, is that we organize uh, death cafes. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but they can be informal places where people maybe don't know each other, but they know that this is a place, talking about permission, like this is a place where it's okay to talk about these issues that we don't often talk about maybe in daily life. Um, and we've organized some of these um, before, in my research program, but never on, like by and for the queer community. So um, that's what we want to do. Um, and then the focus is to make it really intergenerational because a lot of queer spaces in Sweden, they're so delineated according to age, but this, we really need this to be an intergenerational thing. Um, and this is happening then in, in Stockholm, so that's the capital city, and hopefully we can do this in different places as well, also in more rural places and um, uh, hoping that that works out as a way to get this conversation going and also uh, invite people to the research and hopefully uh, lift these voices up in a sense that a, a sense of urgency grows um, with the care providers, hopefully. Um, yeah, and I also feel like a sort of a distrust for researchers because of all of this. So even though I'm part of the community myself, they see me as a researcher and they see me as part of the healthcare system. So. Uh, there's a lot of gatekeeping going on too. So it's a bit of a, um, uh, yeah, messing with my mind sometimes. Um, so then I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, being a queer researcher in the, and uh, I realized that this is videotaped, but I hope that uh, no one from Sweden is <laughs> watching this. <laughs> um, uh, because I thought about like, where can I, where can I find um, places that I feel safe to talk about 
like these reflections. And I think this is a space like that, so I'm just really happy to, to do that. Um, so yeah, no, but I've been feeling quite vulnerable uh, in, for example, talking with um, uh, healthcare providers, for example, when they give me these responses. And I'm sometimes thinking, do you understand who you're talking with? I mean, you're talking about me, my, like, my chosen family, my future. Is it not important? Um, uh, and then also this fear of pushbacks. I mean, we talked a little bit about minority stress and I realized that uh, like theoretically I knew about this and I've thought about this in terms of older people uh, living with minority stress, but then I realized, oh, maybe, maybe I have this too because I'm so, I'm sort of expected to, I've, no, I've, I expect to experience discrimination and this kind of stuff. So, and then when this actually happens, uh, it also feels like a personal attack. And um, so we also deal with the changing political climate in Sweden now. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's happening all over Europe now, it seems like, where we have 20% of the population voted, or 25% 20 of the people who voted, voted for um, an extreme right-wing yeah, no, uh, neo-Nazi party who is also openly anti-LGBTQI um, lives. And... Um, that makes me feel unsafe too, like because I don't know who I'm talking with, really, because uh, that's one out of five people potentially. So, and then I realized that I've been sort of modulating my outness uh, in relation to this. But then there's a flip side to this too, because in talking with Robert and Nate and other colleagues, I also f have understood that there is a I have a kind of power of being um, of like having a privilege as a researcher at a medical university that's very well respected, so I can ask the questions, you know, uh, and that, that feels really empowering to do that, the questions that I think are important, um, and also that I can use my privileges as a, a cis and male presenting person, and I'm a, a white EU immigrant because I'm from the Netherlands, but I've lived in Sweden for a long time, so and I'm, so I am an immigrant, but it's, I don't have at all, you know, the experiences that other people have, but I can anyway ask the questions. Um, highly educated with an academic position, uh, so I can try to create sort of spaces, uh, yeah, for people with less privilege, basically. And that then leads to radical outness. So I've been sort of going between uh, also what some, some other person said, like going in and out of the closet to also just being like, I'm so gay. <laughs> uh, to use it as a, as a strategy somehow. Um, should we talk a little bit about this? Do you want to say something? Hey. Sorry, that's the best image I could get of minority stress here. Yep. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, my issue is with this theory. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, I do not think this is strong enough. Yeah. I don't. I'm, I think this is more like, you know, epistemic injustice. Uh, this is much stronger. Yeah. And both of you gave examples of oh, I anticipated that I would experience stigma, it kind of somehow then gets turned on us. You know what I mean? Like, oh, so we anticipated it because it's happened so much? Like, so yeah, I don't know if this is the right one. I don't know what anyone else thinks, but I wouldn't use this theory for this situation. Sure. Um, one of the things I was gonna say about, um, some of us talk, we were talking about healthcare environments, and I just wanted to say that from you know, in terms of safe spaces and research, one of the things I heard, um, it, it just came up in the conversation sometimes, and they may be, you know, heterosexual, cisgender women that I was talking with, and I'd say, oh, do you know any, you know, 2 LGBTQ people in your workplace? And they'd say, yes. And then we'd talk a bit about more, and then I found out that typically they were not very out in their workplace, and I remember this one participant said, Robert, you have to understand healthcare is a very conservative environment. And so even though the people are protected by, you know, legislation where they can't, they're, you know, less likely to be fired, would have to make some nuances to do that. But 
when they were in the workplace, like you were talking about, um, Max talking about sort of going in and out of, in and out of the closet almost like while they're working. And I, I thought that was an interesting point about that. I think, I think with um, the minority stress model though, I think it's just sort of like a, they use it to compartmentalize the different kinds of stigmas and you know, it's kind of helpful that way for us. Um, in the model, they also have this idea, which this probably wouldn't like, is the, uh, the idea towards positive marginality, where you sort of take your identity and you kind of, you know, you feel supported in that and you can uh, sort of be a bit more out and a bit more open and a bit more, have a little bit, experience a bit more freedom. So, you know, one of the things I like about the model is it, just, it has both pathways, but I do find it's, um, I like, um, you know, conversations the best and trying to draw parts out of conversations and, and see where things lead that way. Um, did you have a, a sort of a section to go on? No, after not that? really, but I'm really curious to hear more about why you don't think this is a good model to work on. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's hear some more about <laughs> because, that. Because, yeah, it's kind of interesting if people don't agree with each other. Uh, <laughs> But did you mean, because I'm not sure if I heard it correctly, did you mean that it doesn't take into account some s s the structural problems or or that it's like, I don't know, but you can talk. I, f I guess I feel like when I see this and I hear stigma and I'm hearing about sort of like these interactions, it doesn't feel like it gets at the level of damage. Um, and sort of existential problems that are happening because you have end of life, which is already such a potentially <laughs> intense experience, and then you're layering all of this on top of it. So yeah, I would love it if anyone else has ideas of theories that they think better speak, but for me, I feel like Fricker's work, for example, that moves beyond talking about stigma. I'm like, this is not, this is, it feels much deeper than stigma, so. Mm. So, so something that would include like, um, you know, systemic issues and the things that we seem to not be able to overcome. And one of the things we, we, we you were talking about, Max, is that, um, you know, people felt this sort of complacency. Some people, and I remember for a while, a while I was talking uh, the last few years to older gay men say in their 70s and they sort of like, oh, everything's all right now, right? Look at how much we've gained. And I, my answer to that is like, well, you know, how, co how come it persists that we have so much, uh, um, you know, suicide among transgender youth, for example, um, you know, suicide ideation, depression among older gay men. And it's like, if we have succeeded, we should see those things diminish, right? So I think um, there's a lot of well, there's so much work to be done, and I think it's really important not to become complacent, that's for sure. And uh, that's, that's sort of what keeps me going in the research. Um, oh, I just before we go on, I wanted to say for, for my researcher to just give thanks to the CIHR, Canadian Institute of Health Research, and then also for with me as well for Nate. He's been a mentor to me as well as he's been mentoring Nate as well. So we're very thankful to Nate for all the work. Um, let's see if we can have a few more questions around um, just people's experiences in. Um, Do you want to flip the slide? What's that? Do you want to flip the slide? Are those the questions? Let's see if I have that. Oh, actually, we should ask. Um, these are these are um, Max's questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, actually, yeah. How can we involve uh, people to us LGBTQ plus in the type of research? Um, how can we engage care staff and care organizations? And what are the strategies for? for being queer in research, resilience, and, and, and in the face of minority stress, like maybe you have some suggestions for Max about that feeling of, you know, that he thought, oh, I hope nobody's watching this in Sweden, right? It's just, you know, it comes from an internal point of view. Um, before we go on about participatory action research, I did want to say um, one thing that, in my opinion, it's, it's taking a lot of time for ethics to catch up to us. Um, I, 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 I wanted to have that but I actually called my research um, participatory action inspired because um, to apply for ethics, they, 
they asked for all of the paperwork and the um, semi-structured interview questions, everything that I wanted to develop with my steering committee, which would be comprised of 2 LGBTQ+. So I, it, they made me go backwards, and then I had the documents, and it's like, well, this is what I had to submit, and I show this to the people, but when you think about the power relationship, it, it's different for me to say, well, this is what I created. What do you think the power relationship's gonna say? They're gonna go, oh, well, you're the, you know, you're the person with the doctorate, I guess they're all good. But it's much different if we just sit down and go, we wanna do some research, and hey, what, what are the good ideas? What should we be asking people? Then you get way more feedback. Anyways, let's go around and see if um, people have some answers to uh, Max's question to get him help him started in participatory action research. Um, I don't know if this is specifically related to research, but I'm thinking like right now with the pandemic, many, many more people are becoming disabled um, and we're having this situation with um, not having access to the supports that people need in order to survive. So people having to make the choice to end their lives when they want to be alive. And I think that's really hard and not fair. And so I think that also needs to be part of this conversation as well. Um, so that, like, I guess it's an important time to be having this conversation, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, sometimes I don't really hear well because <laughs> we're sitting behind the speakers. Um, but are you talking about um, euthanasia? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've been having in Canada, I guess, there's been a few cases of people who've applied for like, um, like medical assistance in dying. Um, but because of the inadequacy of kind of the social services that we have, um, and um, yeah, and not having access to the proper housing mm. um, and things like that, that would make life livable. So I think that too is important, right? Like agency, you, so you're not really, yeah. you don't really have agency in that situation because the only th thing you have agency over is deciding to end your life, which um, it's, good. <laughs> it's a good thing, but you know, Mm. Yeah, and sorry. <laughs> no, but thank you. It's also interesting because it's such a different um, context uh, in, in Sweden where it's not legal to have euthanasia. Uh, and, uh, but every time we have, for example, these death cafes, people want to talk about it. It's really, people really want this. But there's no politicians who dare to touch the topic. Um, thank you so much. I'm really happy we're having this conversation. Um, I think that when it comes to queer life, we, um, like much of our relationship with healthcare and much of the success we've had is less, I think, a recognition of the value of queer life and more a recognition of the fact that they can save money on healthcare mm -hmm. um, by, um, by providing better um, and earlier prevention and treatment options. Um, and so I think when we get into this conversation about death and dying of queer people, um, it's where communities really need to be centered in the conversation because it's actually about what motivates us in the work, which is the beauty and the love that we have for each other. Um, and I don't know if that will ever really like permeate acute care. Um, in the way that we want and need it to. It exists there in the queer people and in and non queer people who are um, are doing that work because they're they're people and they connect and they have spirit and love in them. But I um yeah, I think I, I think that community um, and and across generations really need to be like I love that work you're doing um, in community because I think that with a lot of success, we've lost the thread on what brings us to this movement and this work. And it's, it's love for queer life. Mm. It's not about stopping HIV. That's meaningless in itself. It's about love and care for each other. And I think this conversation has the power to recenter us on that. So thank you. Mm. Thank you. I did want to say something about that idea of community. Um, the, the woman I told you about it was caring for, caregiver for her brother. 
um, he had to move, he, they were in this area in Vancouver, but then they, they moved, he was gonna go into a long-term care in Victoria area. And uh, she was the one who had the question about, um, it's, it's she, they checked the box, yes, her, her brother's a gay man. And so, but no resources were ever given to her for that. And then she went to, into Victoria and she tried to find resources there. And there was no, there were no organized resources to assist. And she actually went to a, a local gay man's group there and said, would anyone in your group be willing to come and visit my, host, my brother in the long-term care? And so a couple of a couple of men um, volunteered, and you know they went down to visit the man in in the long term care home. I, I they got in about two or three visits before COVID started, but she said that the visits really made him feel part of the community just by having someone to talk to. That are there, there were other gay men, but um, then COVID happened, and um, of course he couldn't have any visitors. And actually, it's really sad because he he um, he basically, in her opinion, and to me it sounded like it too. He just he just died from loss of hope. And after about three months of not seeing anybody and just being all alone, it was, it was kind of sad that uh, that was the end of his life. But it, it would be nice if we had some organized support where this, each person doesn't have to go, you know, how do I help my brother? And, and have to go and do such effort to look for that support for, for a brother. So anyways, we'll continue on with the questions if someone has a comment. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, just observing a couple things, this is going to be a very intense session for a lot of people. As a reminder, HIM does have counselors on site to be able to provide the service. So if you needed to debrief with someone after today's session, please uh, hit up checkhimout.ca with counseling at checkhimout.ca and we'll be able to help you with that. So with that note aside, um, I think this research is uh, very interesting um, and very important. Um, I myself am very interested in the academia around death and dying. Um, and I'm not as familiar with uh, the career community in Sweden, but um, as far as how we've seen a lot of people within the community be engaged in this sort of research, um, or in research that uh, involves this particular community in general, is that a lot of uh, community organizations are utilized in that regard. Um, being the program director him, we see a lot of requests from researchers come into our inboxes to help um, them collect data. Yeah. So if there's a similar group like this in Sweden, for example, yeah. um, I'd probably use those as resources. Um, and I think almost an important thread that a lot of people have been touching on here too is the various types of deaths that people face. So there's, of course, like the physical death that we observe. We see someone's life expire, but then we also see certain types of deaths. So like um, a death of identity. So one has to go into the closet and that identity dies. And in many instances, we're talking about social deaths here too. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, as we get older, sometimes we become invisible and we die in the community socially. And I really like that term involuntarily lonely. I think that really captures a lot of that uh, sense of hopelessness that people do get in the community as they get older. Because as they get older and as we all get older, we're gonna be losing friends and family left and right and we get progressively more lonely. So I think a good way to kind of um, look at this is that like, how do we keep these people within the community and from having a social death, right? And just keep that death to the one death, just like the physiological death, because there are other ways to maintain that kind of life, right? So. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really interesting. And I also, that's sort of where I'm really interested in intergenerational interaction around these things, and I'm so happy to see so many young people also in this room. Uh, I don't know what I expected, but it was really, <laughs> it's really nice to see. Um, and uh, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say something else. Oh, I'll think about it later. Okay. I just want to say, just to, just to follow up on, you know, how you talked about resources, and, you know, we had certain resources that people could to access if, you know, if they had some grief in the conversation. And, um, you know, for Max, if you're doing this work, um, I didn't feel it was that well set up for me, and actually I needed it. Um, especially when I talk to caregivers and when I talk to patients, you know, I'd often talk at 10 or 11 in the morning, and then I would carry the story with me the whole day, and I just like, I can't get it, I just can't get it out of my head, and like I would replay it, and I'd, I'd, I'd almost be grieving all day, and, and, and that frustrating, so it's, I think one of the things is when we're doing this kind of research, we have to make sure that we 
have a way to take care of herself as well. Anyways, we have another question. Oh, yeah, I was, um, and it, <laughs> it is going to sound mildly crass in the contradiction to the beautiful words you had to say, um, but, and I don't know how it is in Sweden, um, but here, um, the people generally working in care organizations, nurses, and those who are caring for people in hospice are incredibly overworked and incredibly underpaid, as well as the 2SLGBTQ community at large is relatively um, lower paid. So literally, the idea of them having to take extra time to participate in research um, is really difficult. So um, literally paying people is um, my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even, I've, I've tried this too, even though I don't have money to pay anyone, but, <laughs> but I've suggested this, like, would you be able to participate if you would be paid to do this? And then he said, well, no, because who would, I mean, if you buy my hours, who would do my job then? Uh, and so then I've tried to find um, uh, projects that are already ongoing. There was a project about uh, preventing loneliness among older people in the community. Um, uh, that was sort of run by uh, yeah, primary care, or I don't know how you say, like uh, family doctors. Those those people would sort of c c try and understand if this person was involuntarily lonely and so on and so on. So I tried to meet with these people and I said, but you know that it's mostly the people who are most lonely, they belong to minority groups. So should we, do you have like specific focus on queer people or people with foreign backgrounds or? Oh. And they were like, no. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. Uh, I have, oh. first of all, I'd just like to clarify that I'm sp speaking about this in the Canadian context because that's where I am. Yeah. And second is that my experience is, while unique, they're not isolated. And it's more so to address the question that you had on there of who are we missing. Mm -hmm. And one of the conversations that I feel is missing is the conversations from the perspective of immigrants, specifically those of refugees. I am a refugee here in Canada on the basis of my sexuality. At the risk of sounding morbid, I legitimately do not know what will happen to my body if I were to die. Um, I have family members who have never have seen in eight years um, who are not in contact with the fam chosen family that I have here. So in the event of death, I don't know if that's going to be communicated. I don't know how that's going to be resolved in that way. So, I think it's an interesting conversation because especially um, in the sense of immigrants and refugees, I know it's a common thing that we legitimately cannot plan for the future because we do not know how far in the future can we plan. So it's an interesting conversation to just sort of put into perspective that end of life might not necessarily be that far down the road for certain people because yeah. in my sense it becomes a bit more of a um, of a short, shorter term goal because in the event of an accidental death or anything like that, it has to happen a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. It has to be facilitated in a, in a way that sort of crosses geographical and politi political boundaries in a way. Mm -hmm. So just putting that into perspective, what yeah. can be missing from that conversation? I just want to ask you um, th that when we do research, we do find that we don't get a broad participation. It's basically we have to do surveys where we get a more a diverse population. So how would we build trust so that we could get access to say, you know, Im immigrant populations who are members of the 2S LGBTQ plus community and out, then also perhaps visible minorities? Like, what, if, do you have any suggestions for gaining trust? I think in a way that I've, in my experiences of being part of these kings is one being upfront with your goals and objectives. And like, yeah, we sort of throw around that word of trauma porn quite a bit and sort of framing it in the way that we are trying to make things better. Um, understanding that there's going to be hesitancy in there and meeting people where they are and making sure that the languages that you're using is going to be um, in the language that they understand, uh, culturally sensitive and making sure that if even so, if you're trying to bypass that and being very specific, specific, I'm talking about specific immigrants coming from specific regions of the world that might generate more interest because sometimes we kind of use that as a broader term that people don't want to identify because they don't feel like they're part of that community. So, mm -hmm. Um, I just want to thank folks for positioning their relationality when in these discussions. 
and I want to position all of us collectively, uh, and I, I believe it was also spoken over there, so thank you, but from, from an indigenous uh, sort of perspective, this particular land that we're, we're situated on right now, this was actually shared at the Two-Spirit Symposium earlier this week. Um, <laughs> the Two-Spirit Illuminati got together. <laughs> but we come to the understanding that these lands that we stand on, that we conduct ourselves on here in Vancouver on this unceded territory of our nations, is that this land is like the land of the death in a good way. It's the land of letting go. Because you see the sun and you're the last to say, I'll see you in another way. We're the last ones here on these lands that see that moon as well and the teachings that come with it and leave it in a good way. So I just want to position that for each of us, that as we leave here, leave that in a good way and give it to the water, as we say. That's the letting go ceremony. That's also a part of these aspects that we're talking about, a journey home. Even for myself, I have to do consistent letting go ceremonies because of these uh, stresses that, that we've been talking about. And like, that's one model, but let's create new models. But that being said, I would like to offer some insights on potential situations of addressing these, these questions that are right in front of us. Uh, obviously, you're, <laughs> You're, you're a great individual, uh, so if there's any sort of networking, and I see, um, I know all you queers love to network, <laughs> all right? You love talking, you love meeting new people. But that being said, within Saskatchewan, that's where I'm situated on, Treaty 6 territory, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, I would find it so fascinating to find out how a Nehio, two-spirit, trans gay man who comes with privilege? I think like, just because I, I have that stubborn joy and I always want to like, be able to make it better. So many of the uh, healthcare staff know me because I, I stubbornly joyful in, in their faces. Um, that means I, I raise heck for them. For all of you other ones, <laughs> I'll translate that for you. <laughs> but that being said, there is a trans health coalition that is in Saskatchewan that I think this would be a fascinating aspect of centering the community because we've already worked together to center our voices and to center in a way where we are talking about intersectionality within trans health. But then how does this translate, pun intended, to us looking after our, our trans elders? And I would be so fascinated to see how, further to that, we can look at two-spirit or indigenous worldviews of that going home ceremony. What does that look like? And I would, I would more than uh, encourage you to go and check out Two Spirits in Motion, or even here at CBRC, it would be some great opportunities for us as Indigenous people to share ways that allow us to let go. So, hey. I just put that up now so that if people want our email addresses, we can write, have time to write them down, <laughs> but we still have um, time for, I think we have time for another comment. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, address one of the questions that you had up there. Do you need to see it again? Um, <laughs> yeah, so the how can we engage care staff and care organizations? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm a sexual health educator um, located in Nova Scotia, and we've noticed that the root of many of these issues is do not let queer experiences be an elective in training and in education. We are in the community. You're going to experience us. So at like in, because in Nova Scotia, I know it's different in other provinces, you have to go through extensive training to be working in seniors' homes and to be a care worker. And this, and I know from experience, it's not taught, like it's not mentioned. So I think just, and by, it won't at first impact the people who have been working and who are not doing that training, but having more people with that training will slowly introduce it into the culture. Mm. I guess, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, 
I guess a question for me would be like, um, health system failures are, no are nothing new for our communities, and so what can we learn from queer models of community care? I'm thinking about like um, HIV histories around how our communities banded together in the midst of those failures, for example, and I think that's still happening today. So um, not to let mainstream healthcare institutions off the hook, but to like, what, what wisdom do we have within our own communities around how we look after each other? And how can we bring those learnings into some of these more um, institutionalized environments? As a burgeoning indigenous queer academic, in terms of um, sort of systemic or structural things that you might do to help engage communities, I would strongly encourage you to identify talented young queer mm -hmm. members of these communities to raise up through having master's programs, doctoral yeah. programs, yeah. have them as your, supervise them, raise their voices so that they can reach into their communities and support them in the ways that mm -hmm. um, are, are, are difficult. Um, because we're not represented in the academy very yeah. frequently. Um, and often our questions are the same as yours, but we have access to the people who might have the answers to them. So that would be one thing. have time for just about a one minute question because I think they're gonna start opening that door or a one minute <laughs> comment. Thanks. I'll, I'll try to keep it really quick. Um, uh, yes, we have a lot of lessons to learn from HIV and, and um, breast cancer among uh, women identified people, but I think we also um, really need to do some hard looking within our own communities about ageism. Yeah. And, and how we can lift each other up, build those bridges across generations. I'm thinking about that more and more, the more gray hair I get. And um, um, it's one of the th reasons I love working with students a lot, I work a lot with students, um, to have that mutual mentoring that goes on, but also just to like share across generations. Um, there is some sort of weird bifurcation that happens when you start going to pride less. Mm. <laughs> and in part because pride is very focused on youth. Um, and as you start to have other responsibilities, whether it's parenting or parenting your parents, um, you know, that those things become less accessible. Mm. So I think we really, it's, it's okay to talk about the external forces and the structural forces that you know, in healthcare systems, but I think we also need to take a hard look in our communities about how do we, how do we want to build something different, mm -hmm. um, yeah. using the strengths and the resources that we have. Um, so um, I don't mean that to sound like a downer, because I think there's a lot of possibility there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'll wrap it up there. Okay. I'll, I'll was a, try and was a I'll try and switch that to the positive because it's, 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 I like the idea of the cross generations, and then I like when you said the comment about. Um, the different people in the staffing and um, one of the things that I had this idea from my research is that um, with the programs of say um, you know training people to be more well sensitivity but now it's cultural humility but uh, training people to be more better equipped to work with uh, to us LGBTQ plus patients when people have tried to access management and like um, Max said, they just said, well, we don't have any gay people here, right? But now I find that there's this, and I've always, I've been trying to go into the middle, and I talk to healthcare, like, you know, frontline nurses, things like that, and there's sort of an energy building there. So I'd like to finish on, you know, that, that I feel that that intergenerational component and that sort of don't go for the top, go in the middle, and then we can have kind of this grassroots, um, ideally affect change over time. Do you have a final? I, Thanks. Just um, for people that might not know, um, CBRC shared a tweet um, recently. There's an event next week happening, planning with Pride, a three-day national virtual conference um, um, to engage two SLGBTQ plus older adults in conversations about health, wellness, care, end of life, and grief. So mm. if you're interested, that's happening next week. And that's virtual? So I can... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Do you have any 
Yeah, no, th I, I think the comment on the intergenerational thing is really interesting, also related back to the first answer that someone gave today about uh, what is end of life for you, and then it was 65. And I think it's sort of uh, maybe a symptom of that we don't have these, I mean, I wonder sometimes, because a lot of my queer friends, they don't see themselves getting old, and I think it's because we don't have these examples. And then the other day I was listening to a podcast where these people were saying, oh, we lost a whole generation of queer people due to AIDS. And then I thought, no, we didn't. They're still alive, but you're just not talking to them. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for that comment. We really have to do a lot of work there. Thanks, everybody.